Hi, I'm DJ Ware, and welcome to the uh, weekly news. This is week ending August the 11th. So our top story is the Intel stories. So I've kind of bundled these together. Uh, so if you're wondering, well, gee, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Why are you talking about all that? This week, we're starting with Intel and the problems that are piling up and are becoming very hard to ignore. The layoffs that hit in July are now beginning to show up uh, in other parts of Intel, such as multiple Intel driver projects for Linux. Uh, these are ones that keep the CPUs, the GPUs, and key uh, peripheral components talking with the Linux kernel. Uh, many of them have lost active maintainers and are falling into the, beginning to fall into the category of inactive. Uh, if, a, if a driver falls into the inactive category where it's not being updated regularly enough, Linus will drop it from the kernel. He has done that in the past. That's his standard practice. So unless Intel finds somebody to pick up those projects, it's only a matter of time before those will be dropped from future kernels entirely. Then there's this controversy that started out in Washington, D.C. Senator Tom Cotton sent a letter to the Intel chairman of the board questioning with concerns that Intel CEO Lip Bu Tan may have conflicts of interest tied to outside ventures. I'm going to leave the politics out of this. I mean, that's for others to argue over. This isn't a political channel. But uh, yeah, it, that definitely could lead to problems because Intel, like many uh, tech contract, are, are military contractors. And so they have to adhere to a higher standard of ethics than your normal, uh, your normal companies. On the technical side, Intel is also making changes to their CPU temperature driver in upcoming kernel versions, and it's raising concern uh, from many maintainers and security engineers that the, this new behavior may underreport. Uh, that is, it may understate the temperature of the actual CPU. So in simpler terms, the OS may not know what temperature the chip is actually running at and therefore not take action to crank up the fans or to slow down the chip frequencies or to even stop processes on that particular core altogether. And that is how hardware gets scorched. Combine that with Intel firmware and microcode packages are now being updated less frequently due to those same shortages of people that are able to maintain it, we're beginning to see a risk that could spread across the stack. You have to remember that Intel just isn't just a desktop CPU or a desktop GPU. These CPUs run in supercomputers. They run in cloud. They run in AI nodes. Uh, they run Kubernetes clusters and data lake servers all throughout the world. If the firmware isn't patched and the kernel drivers go stale, the damage is just a, isn't just a consumer issue. It's something that affects all of us. I just mentioned it last week, didn't I? I said in last week's news, I said, uh, gee, you know, I don't think this is the last. We're this was after announcing that Clear Linux was gone. I said, I don't think this is going to be the end of the troubles. And uh, you wait and see. We didn't have to wait very long, did we? Just a week. The second story today is kernel development news is full enough that I'm bundling them together into a single update. First, there's a lot of work that's going around on the scheduler uh, to refine and improving how Linux balances workloads across mixed performance CPU architectures. While EEVDF uh, remains in play for some builds, it's default on some, it's not for all. There's discussions about whether to keep tune it or to even bother to keep it long term. As of, I think it was 613, it was moved back uh, and CFS replaced it. That's the fair share scheduler that was the default before EEBDF took over in 612. 
In uh, in file systems, ButterFS gets smarter background uh, defragmentation and balance behavior. XFS improves metadata corruption handling, and EXT4 gains some fixes for a rare but nasty race condition. And in what may be the most blunt moment of the week, Linus Torvalds publicly uh, rejected the latest RISC-V firmware updates, calling them, in his exact words, garbage. His issue isn't just with the style or being nitpicky. It was about the quality and maintainability uh, and the fact that poor quality, low-level code can destabilize an entire architecture's future on Linux. It's a reminder that no matter how trendy a CPU architecture becomes, if the code isn't rock solid, written well, it doesn't make it into the next kernel. Our third story this week is Linux Mint 22.2, codenamed Zara. Uh, this is a public beta, and Linux Mint has opened this public testing for Mint 22.2. This is the next point release on top of Mint 22. Expect the usual fit and finish upgrades, plus, you know, you can look at updated desktops such as Cinnamon 6.4, XFCE 4.20, Mate 1.26, all riding on Ubuntu 2402.2 LTS uh, as the baseline. So if you're a Mint user who likes to help shape, you know, the final releases of things, now's the time to pitch in and help test. I mentioned this briefly, but this is uh, Tails 7.0 release candidate was released recently. Uh, Tails has shipped RC 7.0 RC1 for public testing that's now based on Debian 13 Trixie and GNOME 48. There's a refurbished app set based on GNOME Console, Lupa, and updates to Tor, Thunderbird, and Onion Share. There's also a UNI cleanup in, in the welcome flow, and of course, Trixie brings with it higher memory use, and so the minimum requirements for memory have been bumped from 2 gig to 3, just like I said in the uh, Debian 13 video, if you haven't watched that. So, uh, and that could result in a little bit longer startup times. It's a release candidate, so if you rely on Tails uh, for your Windows to test workflows and report bugs, you can do that before the final release, but I wouldn't advise using this in production just yet. I think it's scheduled to come out first or second week in October uh, is the when RC7 should officially release. The fifth story uh, this week is about artificial intelligence. It is moving into the Linux application base. Uh, artificial intelligence has been creeping into the Linux desktop, and this week we saw several major moves that signal that permanent shift. Only Office added a beta to their cloud-based AI assistance, which allows their developers to experiment by offering summarization, rewriting, and translation right inside the Office suite. I believe it also allows you to create graphs and take data and find the best representation for displaying it graphically. Uh, so yeah, and that's right inside the Office suite. But that could raise privacy concerns because the AI engine is cloud-based and not local. GNOME developers are also experimenting with integrated AI features through, although details remain limited. We'll have to wait and see how that shakes out and what they're actually planning to do. But all we know for sure at the moment is they're planning to add AI features into GNOME. In the development area, uh, AI has been showing up in IntelliJ IDEA 2025.2, which shipped with an offline AI code completion model, allowing programmers to get AI-assisted suggestions without sending their source code to the cloud, which I think is a good, I mean, I mean, it's a good idea that it's offline. I'm not quite so sure about the idea of having AI generate code. My opinion of AI's ability to generate code is not very high based on my experiences with it. Uh, in the browser world, Mozilla is facing heavy criticism for an experimental Firefox AI feature that users say uh, <laughs> drains laptop batteries 
Uh, yeah, like there was no tomorrow and adding bloat to the uh, browser. So, I mean, I think the tension is pretty clear here that AI is, is trying to promise convenience to Linux users, but Linux users are asking hard questions about transparency, resource usage, whether local AI should be always uh, should always be the default and we avoid the cloud, which I personally agree with. And I have some information about that at the end of this video. Fedora is adopting some of the clear Linux inspired optimizations. At least they're looking at them. Let's put it that way. I don't believe I've seen a, t a commitment to it just yet, but they are discussing it. So even though Clear Linux is officially discontinued, some of the DNA is starting to appear elsewhere. Most notably, uh, Fedora's immutable desktop spins like Silverblue and uh, Kenoit, Fedora engineers have begun exploring Clear Linux style optimizations. They're focusing on keeping the OS lean, reproducible, and fast out of the box. Uh, these changes aim to make Fedora immutable additions not just more secure, but also more competitive with performance-tuned systems, especially on modern Intel hardware uh, or AMD hardware, too, because uh, the optimizations that Clear Linux did benefited both platforms. In a way, I think Fedora is quietly beginning to carry forward the engineering philosophy that made Clear Linux famous, and that's the discipline patching, minimize bloat, and the aggressive tuning, I should say. I wanted to give you a glimpse of what's coming next on the channel. First of all, I wanted to, I've been getting a lot of questions about the testing uh, that was, the benchmark testing that was done in Debian 13 about, especially around the first and last pie charts. Some people are comparing the two and saying this doesn't add up. I think I've explained this before, and so sometimes I make the assumption that I have users that are coming back that have seen that already, but there's a lot of new users to the channel that have not. So let me explain that here. Uh, those two charts are not meant to be used together. The way it, those are simply... And when you have when you install the test for Pharonic, the first graph is is used to tally up the number of times, and there are multiple tests that occur in every group. So, for example, OpenSSL could have as many as nine different tests within that OpenSSL benchmark. If Debian 13 were to score first on three, they would get a score of three on the first but there's nothing counted in the last. The only time that there's anything ever counted in the last or the first is they either have to have a first place finish on a specific test or they have to, have, they have to come in last place on a, on a specific test. So it, it's not an inner comparison at all. You can't compare them. You can't add them up because they don't, it doesn't work that way. They're not meant to be compared. Uh, if you want a comparison of the total performance, you need to look at the aggregate performance that's above, uh, like the overall chart, for example. Just keep in mind that that's a geo mean and not a harmonic mean or a normal standard mean. And yes, geometric does penalize you if you fail to complete a test because it will multiply as zero and count that against your score. So it will actually bring your score down if you fail to complete a test. So if you have questions about that, I would suggest you take it to the Pharonix development team because I can't help you. I can't fix what you're asking me to fix. Second thing we have is coming up this week is a special uh, event, a special video event that is that I've been planning for a while. It's something that's been kind of in the back of my head. I know that these kinds of things uh, are kind of half interesting, but you might find it interesting for your lab as well. So I have, I have a bunch of these mini PCs. I'm not gonna mention the name, but they're very small and they uh, very lightweight. They come with a, a SATA drive. Yeah, it's gonna be sort of a story about detective work, a uh, story about how bad decisions on my part led to the failure because I'm taking, it's not the, it's, well, 
it's partly my fault. It's partly the design of the machine's uh, boxes' fault. Uh, but it may not have ever been designed to run NVMEs. So, and I don't know what their goal was. So it's, I can't point a finger and say, it's their fault. It isn't. It's my fault for not testing it more thoroughly before expanding it, expanding the NVMEs out. So, and then sticking them in production. I don't usually do that, but I was kind of in a rush to get them there to, to test this new file system that turned out to not be, it, to be a nothing burger because it went commercial. So third, uh, we're going to be pushing hardware in a little bit different way. I have been experimenting a lot with AI workloads on, and this is for localized inf inference, not cloud. I'm not interested in cloud, just like many of you aren't interested in putting your stuff out on the cloud. But what I'm trying to find is I have a set of machines, and I have an AMD that's a Ryzen 9 HX370, I have an Intel, it is a Meteor Lake uh, 185, which is the, uh, that's the largest uh, version frequency-wise. I mean, as far as cores are all the same, they just differ in frequency. So, and I'm comparing those two with uh, my AMD 7700X, which has a NVIDIA uh, RTX 3070 in it. Also, I'll be comparing it to a Mac M3, believe it or not, kind of weird, huh? But what I'm trying to find out is what is the best combination for speed and power consumption? Because that thing back there, I have to power down a lot of equipment in here in order to run it. Otherwise, the circuit breaker blows. I want to compare those and I want to show uh, how we can implement different implementations in order to use uh, the CL, OpenCL, to use the GPU and these various platforms. And a couple of surprises that I had along the way I didn't expect. Uh, for, for example, in one case, the GPU uh, was slower than the CPU only version of the system uh, because the driver uh, for OpenCL is terrible. I hope you enjoy this week. I don't know how far I will get through all this testing to be able to share it with you. But that's the plan, and we all know how plans come out. So thanks for watching, and if you found this useful, uh, please subscribe to the channel for more like this. I do this every week, and share it with someone who might enjoy it as well. And thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next, the next video. Bye for now.